Good morning, everyone. Um, Andrew, as Andrew said, my name is Grace. Um, the last column was a little bit of a lie, but <laughs> so I'll introduce myself. Um, I did my undergraduate in communications, which was actually within the Bachelor of Arts. And then I swapped over to commerce for my honours year um, so that I could pursue research in public relations and social movements. So I'm very passionate about those two things and kind of bringing them together. And that's what my research focused on. And I will be graduating next week. So that's very exciting. Um, I was, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of being supervised by Dr. Katharina Wolf, Bridget Tomlinson, and Carly Tillett. Um, and I'm very excited to be presenting my Hive internship project with you all. So as Andrew said, I did spatial mapping of Black Lives Matter. So what that included was bringing together various data sets, including hashtag data, protest data, um, deaths in custody and legislative changes, and putting it together on an interactive and immersive scrolly telling story. So this means that the viewer is kind of guided through the story of Black Lives Matter, and I can bring up different data sets and different stories and pictures, um, kind of how I want to, uh, the audience to do it. But there are interactive elements like pop-ups so that they can explore deeper uh, as they see fit. So just before I kind of jump into my presentation, I want to get an understanding of, I guess, what everyone knows about Black Lives Matter. So can I have a quick raise of hands if you've heard of Black Lives Matter? Awesome. And can you keep it up if uh, you actually know how it started? Okay, a few people, that's okay, then I can tell you a little bit about it. So uh, on the 26th of February in 2012, Trayvon Martin, which is there on your left, um, he was walking home from 7-Eleven. He was walking home to, uh, he was walking home in a gated community called The Retreat at Twin Lakes. He's a 17 year old boy and he's visiting his father and his father's fiance. As he's walking in this community, George Zimmerman, a white neighborhood watch captain, sees him and decides that he doesn't belong in that community. He rings the non-emergency 911 dispatch and tells them there's a suspicious male in here and he doesn't belong here. He then tells the dispatcher, I'm following him and they say, okay, we don't need you to do that. But he continues to follow him and eventually there's a struggle. Five people called 911 and you can hear a young male screaming help. Eventually, he stops screaming because he hear a gunshot and Trayvon Martin, the 17 year old, was killed in the gated community where he was staying. A year later, George Zimmerman is um, acquitted for all charges. He's found not guilty of murder and not guilty of manslaughter. So one black woman, like many others actually, Alicia Garza, she took to Facebook to express her heartbreak, her outrage, uh, and a disappointment in the justice system. And she finishes her status with Our Lives Matter. Her friend, Patrice Callers, replies the status and comments, hashtag Black Lives Matter. And that's kind of where the movement began. This movement has maintained notoriety since 2013 when it was founded, but it reached new heights in 2020 when George Floyd, a 46 year old black man and father, was arrested in Minneapolis. He was handcuffed pinned to the ground, face down, and police officer Derek Chauvin kneeled on George Floyd's neck until he died. In bystander footage, you can hear George Floyd screaming, I can't breathe. And yet, four police officers who were present allowed Derek Chauvin to continue kneeling on him and did not administer first aid, even when they couldn't feel his pulse. Naturally, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it, this video went viral on social media. So I'm from public relations, and you might be wondering how that has anything to do with social movements or Black Lives Matter. I know the PR kind of has a reputation for being spin doctors or kind of stepping in when there's a crisis and really being about protecting a large corporation's rep reputation. But as I've learned at Curtin, PR is so much more than that. Public relations is strategic communication, it's community building, and most importantly, it's storytelling. 
Black Lives Matter is one of the richest global stories that there is in the modern world, and it has been told across social media. So this has been a brilliant learning opportunity for myself and other public relations professionals. Uh, activism, social movements, it's a great way for us to understand the world, understand our audience, and understand our role in social change. Coming into this project, I had three objectives. The first one was to tell the story of Black Lives Matter from a global perspective, because public relations literature has often focused on the US, and it has largely, uh, I guess, been dominated by that, and there are, uh, other parts of the world are quite underrepresented. Black Lives Matter in particular has only been studied from the US when it comes to um, public relations literature. And uh, any scrolling stories like what I've done have been, again, focused in the US. So I really wanted to capture the whole world and kind of what that story looks like in different parts of the world. I also wanted to explore the organic growth of Black Lives Matter and see kind of what key events led to its expansion and whether that was something like social media, uh, key deaths that really gained notoriety, uh, any, uh, I guess, legislative changes, kind of capture it all and see uh, how it's grown over the years, over space and time. So that's where the multiple layers of data come in. So I can really get kind of a cohesive and comprehensive insight into the movement. So uh, these are kind of the steps I took in this project. Of course, first one, background research, finding out what's missing in the picture of Black Lives Matter. And that's where I determined the research objectives. My data collection included kind of finding different databases of um, information, so hashtag data, protest data, uh, legislative changes in the US, and um, deaths in custody in the US. From there, I had to create a storyboard. So that's kind of the old school version, pictures and the text that goes with it, um, so that I could really map out what story I wanted to tell. Then I needed to import the data sets into this really fun software called Mapbox. I had a lot of um, great it was a great opportunity to learn how to use Mapbox. Uh, it was a bit of a learning curve. I'm really glad that I did it with the Hive. And then from there, there's something called Mapbox Storytelling. And that's where you kind of code um, and then decide which data sets or layers you want to bring up from Mapbox into the whole scrolly telling story. And then you have to test Mapbox Storytelling on different screens because it always uh, resizes depending on the size of the screen, so it looked very different on my laptop compared to this screen. And with that comes the editing. So what did I find in my project? Well, the first thing I wanted to look at is whether, um, I should say, uh, I wanted to look at how many black Americans have been killed by the police in the US, because I think it's really important to establish that yes, this is a real issue, and that's why the movement exists. So since 2013, uh, 2,496 black Americans have been killed by police. Um, and this number is said to be, uh, I guess, underestimated because reporting in the US by police departments is uh, very low. Um, so I had to rely on uh, crowdsourced or um, non-government databases to find this number. And some of the people that have been killed by police are very young. Like Tamir Rice, he was 12 years old when he was shot and killed by police uh, because he was playing with a toy pellet gun. And they shot him within two seconds of arriving to the scene. And then I looked at hashtag data. So in May 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, Hashtag Black Lives Matter was used over 2 million times on social media. And you can see that this hashtag is used all over the world. It's not just in the US, but kind of everywhere was engaging with it and quite uh, intensely. Twitter was used by journalists like in the middle uh, to share kind of their perspectives, as well as people who were kind of engaging in citizen journalism where they were sharing their on the ground experiences, and kind of telling the world that way. I found that um, Black Lives Matter may be 
the largest movement in US history. So this is, um, was found by the New York Times. They found that 15 to 26 million people likely participated in protests in June 2020 alone. And that makes Black Lives Matter bigger than the civil rights movement in the height, um, in, at its height in the 1960s, it makes it bigger than the anti-nuclear movement in the 80s, and bigger than protests against the Iraq war. But it's not just massive in the US. I think Black Lives Matter reached all over the world. There were over 10,000 protests in 2020 alone that focused on Black Lives Matter or used Black Lives Matter messaging. So where we are in Perth on the left, we had three rallies uh, in June and July of 2020. And in Perth, we not only stood in solidarity with people in the US, but we really focused on Indigenous deaths in custody and what Black Lives Matter means to people in Perth and in Australia. And it also reached places like South Africa, where there is obviously a large black population. And they could, again, really empathize with Black Lives Matter and have similar shared experiences. I think a really important thing for me was finding out what impact Black Lives Matter has had. It isn't just a social media movement. It's a real tangible movement and it has achieved real change. So from 2020 in May onwards, uh, 25 or more states have brought in legislation that bans the chokehold, that prohibits certain uses of force, uh, that um, makes body cameras mandatory, and also uh, brings in more stringent checks uh, for people who are applying to the police. So they look for things like racial bias now. And those are things that have happened since George Floyd was murdered. So bringing all of my findings together, what does this mean? Um, I think that I found that globe, uh, Black Lives Matter has created kind of a globally connected story and that we are all connected by shared experiences and shared values. I think I've also kind of found that engaging with social media movements is not just slacktivism, which is a really common uh, kind of criticism of social media um, activism where people say, oh, well, if you've tweeted or you've posted, then you haven't done anything more. But I think it's really important that we can see that hashtag data is backed up by protest data and then backed up again by legislative changes. So being able to kind of combat that narrative is really important because we can see the power of social media connecting people around the world and achieving real change. So I have a few suggestions for future research. Firstly, I think it would be really great to uh, create a, an academic use uh, protest database. Um, the protest database I used was kind of limited to 2020 onwards. The one that I found that captured Black Lives Matter from 2013 was not um, available for use at all, which, was, uh, which made my life quite difficult because it would have been brilliant to show kind of the movement as it's grown on the ground. So uh, being able to create a database would be really important. Next, having real-time social media data. Uh, the organization that I worked with who uh, tried to get social media data found it really difficult to kind of get that historical data. Um, we could really only go back two years, so again, 2020. So I would think that kind of capturing it in real time might make that a little bit easier, and we can kind of track that with uh, protests and changes again. Um, I think changes across the world would be really brilliant to explore as well. So in Australia, did we see any changes politically, um, or did it kind of fizzle out? That would be really interesting to explore, and also deaths in custody across the world. Uh, as I was kind of exploring different areas, I found that um, kind of the black American experience was, was not unique and that black people all over the world are victims of state sanctioned violence. And being able to track that is really important because, again, a lot of countries are underreporting these numbers and that doesn't capture the entire story or the severity of the situation. So in conclusion, 
Black Lives Matter is indeed a global social movement. It is not something that has been restricted to the US, but it has really grown through social media and through connection. Um, I think it was really important to use multiple layers of data so that we can really get a comprehensive insight into Black Lives Matter and how it has organically grown across different, um, across space and time. And finally, storytelling is key to connection. The Black Lives Matter story is really powerful and being able to tell that has been a privilege. Um, this project would not have been possible without the Hive. Um, it was a privilege to be able to use these facilities every week. Uh, I would like to thank Kylie. She's put in some incredible hours into this project um, and she's incredibly dedicated and very grateful for that. And also Andrew and Wesley for their weekly support as well. Uh, and then I would also like to thank Katharina Wolf and Bridget Thompson. Um, these two women really inspire me in public relations and it's been really exciting to work with them in this project. And then that's my references, so yeah, thank you.